Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for the opportunity to feast upon your word together, asking you to uh, filter out all of that which is not true, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, for we are sanctified by truth, and your word is truth. Bless those out there, Lord, that are hurting. Comfort the brokenhearted. Comfort those who are in, uh, go undergoing heavy trials and difficulties. I ask your continued direction for this ministry. I ask all of this in your name. Amen. Hi, this is Steve uh, at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to just say something up front before we get started here. Uh, I just want to thank you all for your continued participation in these verse-by-verse -verse studies. Uh, it has been one of my greatest pleasures to be able to continue fellowshipping with you over the Word. I want to thank you for all of your comments. Uh, all of you who have uh, taken an effort to uh, email me, uh, all your questions, all of your comments, those of you who continue to support and uphold this ministry to help keep it going at a time in which uh, it appears that the world is growing darker by the moment. Uh, we're in uh, chapter 12. We're going to begin chapter 12, but I'd like to review just a, a little bit uh, of chapter 11, particularly the end of chapter 11. Chapter 11 folks, it ended with, and I think this is important because it's it's setting us up for chapter 12. It ended with uh, the temple of God being opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, the ark of his covenant. And there were lightnings and voices and thunders and, a, and an earthquake and, and a great hail. Now at the beginning of chapter 11 we notice that the temple building uh, was measured off. Now this temple is opened, the holiest of all parts into which the high priest alone once a year entered, only the high priest. When our Lord the temple, who was the temple, died in our place, You'll remember that the veil of the temple was torn into, ripped from top uh, to bottom. That's, and no man could do that. There's a whole uh, lesson in that, that no man could do that. So we now see the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. John's measuring of the temple seems to be revealing the, the secret abiding place of God's people in the tribulation period where that they find strength and protection. Uh, take serious note of where we're at in our study. Uh, they, they being His temple of God in the Spirit. Okay? It's no different for, for them as, as it is for us today. The only hope of the children of God who are now seen as the temple of God. That is what I believe is being revealed here. That hope being founded upon that everlasting covenant, okay, which was always the anchor of, of Israel's hopes in during any time of trouble. So we see the Ark of God's covenant, the Ark which contained the law, the rod of Aaron, the and the manna, all of which they received from God. You know, that, that bread of heaven which uh, strengthened the, uh, the Israelites during their times of hardship, uh, their hunger, the rod of Aaron uh, representing Christ's power and authority, the law written in their hearts, the ark of God's covenant, the mercy seat where that they, had, they had never failed to receive grace in, in, uh, in time of need. We know that from Hebrews chapter 4. The temple of God was opened. The sovereign power.
power of God will sustain them. Not their own works, because God is faithful. There's, there's so many similarities between what is true of us and what is true of them. It's no different for them. Okay? Same God, different dispensations, but the same God. And out of that open temple, just as around the, the Mount of Mount Sinai, the peak of Mount Sinai, the lightnings are seen, the voices and the thunders are heard, and that which is a power of help to his people became a power of destruction to those who turned from him. We had those who perished, okay, in the wilderness because of their unbelief. You have people that perished during the, the, the seven-year tribulation period. Why? Because of their unbelief. Now, I believe that they're God, God's people. God's people can can were not saved by our faith, okay, but the faithfulness of God. These were God's people who perished in the wilderness, okay? You cannot say that only uh, Joshua and Caleb were the only two that entered into the promised land. I mean, spiritually, okay? Physically, perhaps, but spiritually, they, they didn't. We don't stand upon our own faithfulness. That's an important point to, to recognize. So, but it, it, di it did become, or it will become a power of destruction, that rod of Aaron, to those who turn from him. The spirit of evil, the, the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of selfishness and ungodliness, which can only reject God, leads to judgment and fire and blackness and darkness forever. But the Spirit of God leads to deliverance and salvation, the entering into the kingdom, uh, or in a glorified body resurrected to the new Jerusalem and, and uh, uh, therefore uh, uh, the ultimate end destination being the, the age of uh, the end of the age the age of eternity. So ends chapter 11. That's how chapter 11 ends. That's, and there were no chapter divisions in the original text. Keep that in mind. And this is how chapter 11 ends. And now we're going to get into chapter 12. So it's based upon this revelation that we now see in chapter 12. The woman Israel giving birth to the Messiah. The church. We see a lot there in chapter 12. We see... Christ coming forth, the Messiah coming forth from the woman, Israel, the church being a mystery in Christ, okay, in Christ, we are in Christ, the church was a mystery, okay, where that this male child, okay, seen as, as I believe, not, not everyone does, but I believe the male child represents both Christ and the church, you cannot, you cannot separate the two. Because the church is his body, is caught up to God's throne. And I believe that, that we're seeing the rapture there in that. Resulting in war in heaven, where Satan is defeated and cast out. Where he then pursues the woman Israel who brought forth the, the, the Messiah. Okay? Who, and you could also say who brought forth the, the body of Christ, the body being Christ, Christ being the head, the church being the body of Christ. And the, and the similarity, the identity is that during the tribulation period, they are also, there's still only one temple, okay? One temple, spiritual temple, in the Spirit, in the Lord, or the... Uh, these same people of God, these, these people of God who are tribulation saints, are not church age saints, but tribulation saints are protected, okay? They are nourished, they are cared for, they are delivered, okay, from Satan's destruction, just as we are, or we were, by being raptured. I, I, I wish I could 
really put this in better words. I'm trying my best to get you to understand here that the outer court, okay, was to be left out of the measurement. The word uh, means omit or exclude as unworthy of attention because it's been assigned by God to the Gentiles who will trample Jerusalem for 42 months. The inner sanctuary is what is John is to measure. Why? Because it's in heaven. Now, this is speaking of the heavenly temple in the day of the Lord. Okay, that's not to say there won't be a literal temple, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. But the inner sanctuary is what is John is to measure. Why? Because it's in heaven. This is speaking of the heavenly temple in the day of the Lord. Therefore, chapter 12 is another, what you'd call parenthesis or a pause between chapter 11 and chapter 13, where we are introduced to the Antichrist, uh, the Antichrist system, the mark of the beast, uh, the great tribulation period, and so on and so forth. Will there be a rebuilt, physical, literal third temple in Jerusalem? I believe there will be, if we take Scripture literally. But my point, folks, is that do we worship in a physical temple today? No, we don't. Will they worship in a physical temple in the tribulation period? God's people? No. In this present age of grace, the temple is fulfilled in Christ and His church. We are the temple of God in the Spirit. We worship in spirit and truth. We don't take, I don't take off from Oklahoma and I don't uh, get on a plane and go to Jerusalem every year for the Day of Atonement. Why don't I do that? Because it's, it's ultimate fulfillment for us is in the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. One death, okay? He's not going to die again. And the same is true as it regards Israel in the day of the Lord once God's program for the church has run its course. There will be a rebuilt temple, I believe. You know, the, the ritual of, of sacrificial worship will be reinstated, reinstituted. But it will, as I pointed out in previous videos, it is my belief that through a serious study of Daniel, what it shows is that that sacrifice, those sacrifices will be made to cease by none other than our Lord Himself who confirms His covenant with the many during that, that time period since He Himself was the Lamb of God that was slain. He puts a stop to those sacrifices. Why? Because they are an abomination to Him. He was the Lamb of God that was slain. You know, most, under, most, most understand today that the Jews, they can't really lawfully re, reinstitute the temple and, and all of its uh, ordinances and, and sacrifices because they don't know who, who's a Levite and who's not. And, and God has already proclaimed it done away with. The Mosaic Law and Old Covenant was only until when, what? Until Christ came. And it's now no more. As the entire book of Hebrews says. So there will be, I believe, a literal third temple built after the church has been raptured. But God doesn't have any need for it. He doesn't have any need for an earthly temple or sacrifices, much less sacrifices being offered for the atonement of sins inside Daniel's 70th week because Christ is that temple. That's the point I'm trying to make. He was that once for all sacrifice. I want you to ask yourself, why would Satan or, or the Antichrist put a stop to sacrifices that are an abomination to God. If anything, it, it seems to me like He would want those to continue. It is He, the Messiah, who causes this abomination to cease. That third temple will serve no purpose inside the 70th week. I find it interesting that the day that the temple was destroyed in both 586 B.C. and 70 A.D., was, it was the ninth of Av. And according to the Talmud, this is also the day that the Israelites uh, 
uh, because of their unfaithfulness, they refused to enter the promised land. In the context of the book of Daniel, where are the Jews? Where, where are they at? Well, they're in exile. They're in exile in Babylon. Why? Because they transgressed the covenant. Okay? They were rebellious, apostate, well, except for a few. Therefore, God did as He promised. He cursed them, and they were handed over to their enemies. Listen, handed over to their enemies. God used foreign, pagan, Gentile people as a tool of judgment against His chosen people, Israel, because of their religious and spiritual apostasy it's just exactly what we are seeing taking place in Revelation. Okay? Now, if we fast forward to the first century A.D., what happens? Christ comes as a Jew. He came to His own, and they received Him not. It, unexpectedly. And they reject Him. They refuse to acknowledge who He was, so their rejection and their hatred builds until they, they use the Gentile Romans as a tool of execution and judgment to put him to death for, for what they called blasphemy. They, uh, so what does God do here? He does the exact same thing. He, uses the, he actually uses the ancestors of those Gentile Roman soldiers in 70 A.D. who were stationed... Where were they stationed? They were stationed in Antioch which is today modern Turkey, their descendants as a tool to execute judgment against his people. The descendants of those Roman soldiers who crucified your Lord are those in the tribulation period, are the ones in the tribulation period who invade the land of Israel and again, again, once again, persecute Christ. By, by how? By killing God's people. Persecuting and killing God's people. But take comfort and have joy that Christ will confirm in the hearts of... I've, I've, I've had people write me and say, Steve, how does He confirm His coming? In their hearts. He confirms His already existing covenant Okay, that was made by was signed in blood. It was made by His blood. And He does that at, in, in, at the midst of the 70th week. Just as He led His people out of slavery in Egypt to be the living and breathing temple of God, He'll deliver His people then. Leading, leading His people along in that, in that dark day of gloom, that, that desert wilderness world sustaining his people just as he does with you and me okay sustaining them with daily bread and water from his word until his promise of an earthly kingdom for them because their blessings are earthly is fulfilled this is what we are seeing folks as we leave chapter 11 and enter into chapter 12 I'll throw this up on the screen so you can see this. this. I believe this is what we're looking at. The inner sanctuary of the temple represents both the body of Christ and the tribulation saints. In fact, I believe it represents all saints. Okay? The body of Christ and tribulation saints, whose members are kept from being devoured now. That's you and me. Okay? by Satan, whose members are preserved during the tribulation. The outer court, which John didn't measure, represents the literal third temple, that which is trodden down by the Gentiles for 42 months. Okay? These are not God's people. Now, I've tried to summarize chapter 12. I've gone through it verse by verse, looking very carefully at each verse, and this is what I see. All right? He revolts against God 
Now I'm talking about Satan here. He revolts against God and he fails. He instigates Adam and Eve's fall. He then tries to corrupt the seed, which results in the great flood. He then tries to destroy God's chosen nation, Israel. Okay? Now let's just stop right there for a moment. Most Christians at the present time, when they think of Revelation 12, the only thing that pops into their minds is the sign in the heavens and the rapture of the church. That's it. Okay? You know, forget about all the rest. Folks, there's a lot of stuff going on in chapter 12. Satan then tries to destroy the Christ child that came through Israel. He tries to tempt Christ. He fails in that. He tries to destroy the church and fails because it's caught up to God's throne. War breaks out in heaven because the church is exalted above the angels, which Satan hates. And they're the first fruits of salvation. But we see that he's defeated and he's kicked out of heaven where he then sets about to destroy Israel, the woman that brought forth the man-child, Christ and his body. You can't separate the two. Christ and his body, the church. Okay? Of course, we're in heaven then. Okay? But the tribulation saints are not. And not being able to do that, he then directs his fury toward what? The nations. He turns his fury, his wrath toward the Gentile nations. Okay? Because he doesn't succeed in destroying the woman. So this is a lot of stuff, folks, that we're looking at here. He turns his wrath toward them, hoping to, ex well, hoping to exterminate the entire human race in its entirety. Then when Christ returns, to put a stop to that, he's bound for a thousand years, where he's then released at, at the end of that thousand years, where he then attempts to overthrow Christ's kingdom, overthrow Christ who's ruled and reigned in peace and righteousness for a thousand years. He deceives the nations to try to usurp God's kingdom, where he is then cast alive into the lake of fire. That is the sequence of events as they unfold, given us in the Word. Not just here, not just in chapter 12, but that is the sequence of events as, as they have have unfolded in the Bible. So the pause of chapter 12, it's a pause. It's a, it's a parenthesis. It is, to a great extent, a summary of much of what Scripture in general has revealed. Now, I believe the sign did occur. I am absolutely, positively, 100% the sign occurred. September 23rd, 2017. I've seen, I've, I've seen too much evidence to say otherwise. And I realize much of the interest in that sign focused on the rapture of the church. Okay, But I also believe it involved much more than just an incidental mention of the rapture of the church, which is what we see in Revelation 12 which amazes me since there's so much in, tw in chapter 12 and the rapture is but an incidental mention. I, I think part of that is a result, folks, of people not really caring about serious study, whether it has to do with doctrine or, or even history. They, they're, they're not interested in looking at the overall picture or getting a, an understanding of the chronological order of events uh, as I've laid them out here, uh, like I see it as a, a summary here. They're, 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 they're narrow focused. They're just interested in one thing and one thing only. Oh, Revelation 12, the rapture of the church. That's it. Folks, we can't do that. We can't do that. And I, and I, I hope to explain... You know, for very good reason, we don't want to do that. I hope to explain that. You know, I, it, I need to, I, it, it, it has to be said that every condition of that sign back then in 2017 was met. 
okay scotty clark's seven thousand some odd screenshots one for each of the the six thousand previous years and one for each of the next one thousand uh years they didn't find any matches mark chiswell's algorithm set it apart as unique other studies were done uh, by people such as john bell who proved that it was unprecedented I've, I've personally spoken to seminary professors and pastors who recognized it to be genuine. The sign occurred despite the explanation of the critics. But we learned that it was, surprise, a sign, not an event. I and many others hoped it would be an event. I'm sure many of you did too. Though the text, surprise, referred to it as a sign. How did we miss that? Four-letter word, sign. Not a five-letter word event. But we did. Almost everyone did. What I later suggested was because Revelation 12, 5 is a context of rescue from danger. We understand harpazo to, to mean that danger rescue from the danger of being devoured by satan the dragon and that because christ was was he he was not rescued but he ascended he was not he wasn't in, at any time in any danger and because har, harpazo was never used of christ's ascension to heaven therefore it wasn't speaking of the ascension of christ but the rapture of the church that rescue is a rescue from, and this was what I suggested, not physical danger at some point, but a rescue away from Satan's intent to destroy the church as we approach the end times. How? How? Doctrinally. Spiritually. I'm not, I'm not in any way suggesting he's not, Satan wouldn't love to kill you physically dead, okay? What I'm suggesting is, is, is that what precedes that, what seems to take, to supersede that, is something doctrinal and spiritual. That because the light is going out, folks, it's growing dark, it's growing dark by the moment, by the moment. Okay, I used to say by the minute, it's growing dark by the moment. I think most of you will agree with that. Now, of course, when, when we talk about that, we want to talk about, we, we, when we think about that, we think about, well, yeah, it's growing dark because of all the evil, that all the ungodliness and all that that's going on. And that's true. But I believe that the light is going out in the sense that the gospel has become perverted, it's become corrupt, that modern Christianity, modern evangelism, the, the, the world religious system as a whole, what I've often referred to as the, a religious system based on human merit, okay? That Satan has near devoured the church, doctrinally, okay? Spiritually. And I believe that now more than ever. And I believe that if we're not raptured soon, Satan will so corrupt the gospel of Christ, replacing its purity with a man-centered other gospel that so permeates and so dominates human society, you know, a, a doctrine of demons that basically says that man must do something to be redeemed, that he'll, he'll nearly consume the, the very gospel itself. 12.5 clearly states that Satan has stood before the woman Israel ready to devour Christ and his body, the church. You can't separate the two since Christ first stepped into time. And I am so convinced, so persuaded, so strongly persuaded that that, that is what we're seeing in 12.5, I can't see anything different. So I want to point this out. When we look at the word devour, 
Revelation 12, 5, the word devour, in the original text, the original Greek, that, that is an intensified word for eat, devour. Okay? And it appears to describe Satan's attempt from the very beginning of the church, the very beginning of Christ, to consume it physically. That is, kill God's people physically. And I, I believe there's some truth to that. But there is zero doubt in my mind that what supersedes that is primarily doctrinal, spiritual. I say that because the church today has strayed doctrinally. It only makes sense that prior to this period of great darkness, the true light will have all but gone out. We know Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And in biblical interpretation, there's something that's, that many of, you, many of you out there have heard of or you understand. It's called the rule of first occurrence. The first occurrence of the Word. We find it in Mark 12. Mark 12. And He said unto them in His doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces, and the chief seats in the, in the synagogues, and the uppermost room, rooms at, at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, these shall receive greater damnation. What does that say? The context of that, and what I just read you, is our Lord's warning against the legalism of the Pharisees. First occurrence. And then we go over to Revelation 12 and we see the word devour in verse 5. I see a direct connection between Satan's efforts to devour the church doctrinally and the rapture. The absence of sound biblical doctrine resulting in what? increased, near complete apostasy. The text says to devour her child as soon as it was born. So I believe Satan's been working on that. He's been working on that for a long time. We've come to a point in human history where that much damage has been done. So I believe the gospel and the rapture are intrinsically related to one another spiritually. And it, so it is with this in view that I now want to take us into chapter 12. Re Revelation 12 is an interlude in what we, we've, we've, been, we've seen going on. Okay? Uh, here in the 70th week. Just a casual reading of Revelation 12 will prove it to be telling a story of what has been, what now is, and what shall be. And this account is, is obviously what God wants His people to know as His return draws near. The story begins with Israel bringing forth the Messiah, and it ends with a kingdom. I'm persuaded that the actual align, alignment of, the, of that sign occurred on September 23rd, 2017 in order to remind Israel and the Gentiles in Daniel's 70th week, primarily, first and foremost, of this story and to confirm those things which are about to unfold. A, a final wake-up call to God's people living in the final last days of a final generation. I pointed out Revelation is not chronological. Contained within John's vision is seen a real-time past, present, and future picture of Israel. A picture of Christ. A picture of His body. The body of Christ. Which is, by the way, it's almost unnoticeable. That's why so many people don't see the church as the male child as well as Christ. Which includes the rapture and the activities of Satan. Christ and His body are an inseparable 
union, okay? The head and the body are not separate entities. The church is his body, spiritually. And harpazo implies a sudden removal from danger. Danger from what? Now, you could say comets and asteroids and earthquakes and war and famine and pestilence and all that stuff if you want to. And you may be right. But I think it's more than that. Her spiritual destruction could be seen as that danger. I believe that to really understand the Revelation 12 sign, we need to first understand the true nature of the gospel itself, which, you know, I think God expects us to understand, which I believe helps explain why modern Christianity in general has scoffed and ridiculed that Revelation 12 sign. I believe that we have been misled and distracted from the spiritual perspective of the dragon's desire to devour the body of Christ spiritually, doctrinally, through a per perversion of the gospel. Dearly beloved, he, Satan has tried to destroy the gospel of Christ since the church began. I believe if we are not raptured soon, he will have done just that. It is impossible to separate the church, the body of Christ, the male child, from the gospel. John saw Christianity as born of Judaism through labor. He saw Satan bent on destroying the church since its beginning. He saw it caught up to God's throne, preventing that devouring. And he saw war break out in heaven as a result of that removal from danger. He saw Satan cast down to pursue the woman Israel who gave birth. Looking only at the text. Okay? If you were, if you were to just go verse by verse, I know I've, I've compiled, compiled somewhat of a summary here of Revelation chapter 12, verse by verse. God choosing the nation Israel to, to bring light unto the nations, the twelve tribes of Israel, the intense labor of God's chosen nation Israel to bring forth her Messiah, the fall of Satan and his becoming the God of this world, the expulsion of Satan and a third of the angels from heaven, Herod's efforts to destroy the Christ child, the beginning of the church at Pentecost, the church ruling with Christ throughout the, the thousand year reign of Christ, the rapture, which is really, but it's almost, you'd miss it if you weren't really looking, and God protecting Israel the first half of the tribulation. War in heaven because the church is now in heaven, Satan defeated and forever expelled, salvation, millennium, uh, the thousand year reign of, with Christ as king, Victory over Satan by the blood of Christ through testimony and martyrdom. The rejoicing of the saints and angels in heaven over Satan's defeat. Satan's fury during the Great Tribulation. Satan's intent to utterly destroy Israel. Israel fleeing from Satan with great speed into God's place of protection. A massive invasion intent on Israel's destruction and God through the nations assisting Israel in defeating Satan and his Antichrist, and then Satan directing his wrath against the nations. And then we go into chapter 13, where John goes back to, des to describing events during the tribulation. Folks, Revelation 12 is a broad picture. I hope in some way this has helped. I love you all. I truly do. Please stay safe out there. Until next time, thanks for watching.